We've good reason to envy the Kestrel's piercing eyes. We live like monks in the city, gloomily abstaining from contact with more earthly forms of life. So rarely do we look beyond our noses that it sometimes seems as if cities have swallowed up our imaginations as well as our countryside. But the natural world won't be so easily dismissed. In waste patches and factory backyards, in gasworks and railway sidings, nature fights back. For without meaning to, we've created in our cities a vast prefabricated reserve for wildlife, a network of green oases, makeshift feeding stations and barricaded hideaways. The town bird and urban monk alike, this natural underground can be a real and refreshing sanctuary an unofficial countryside. It really isn't the kind of place you'd expect to go for a stroll to escape that traffic jam. It's derelict, noisy, smelly in the summer months, and to some tastes, I imagine, downright ugly. But stop and look just a little closer. Birds have taken to this flooded gravel pit as naturally as if it were an old established lake. Some of them come to winter, like these cormorants from the coast and their rare grey-headed cousin from Holland. Others stay to breed. Great crested grebes were actually saved from becoming rarities by the great gravel extraction boom. Waterside birds, too, like this inquisitive reed bunting, are making the best of what's really a throwaway landscape. In fact, wherever there's a seam of earth that hasn't been sealed over by the developers, life floods back in. Coltsfoot's one of the first flowers to brighten bare ground like this, and one of the best, I think, with its crisp and uncomplicated flowers coming out as early as February. Coltsfoot actually relishes disturbed conditions where more delicate plants can't get a root hold. And it's this adaptation that marks off authentically urban wildlife. And it's the story we are going to try and follow in this film. Of all the birds that might conceivably adjust to town life, the heron must surely be one of the last you'd think of. Yet in one of the noisiest reservoirs in North London, there's now a heronry of over a hundred pairs. Even here, the birds are as secretive and inscrutable as in their natural fenland. But noise and disturbance is not all a bird must put up with if it moves to the city. It must also be prepared for drastic changes in its diet. Herons feed normally off freshwater fish, but these aren't the easiest things to catch in a deep concrete-walled reservoir. So with a good deal of spivish ingenuity, London herons have begun to loot the city's ornamental ponds. Still, I can't imagine any fledgling heron complaining about regurgitated goldfish. A reservoir has obvious charms. But what could any creature see in an abandoned gasworks, like this one at Beckton in East London? How might a bird look at this labyrinth of pipes and rubble and sheer concrete walls? 
Not surprisingly, perhaps, it was a species used to the stony mountain slopes of southern Europe that moved in to become the star resident of such derelict sites, the Black Red Star. Until the Second World War, the Black Red Star was a very rare breeding bird in Britain. But in the summer after the Blitz in 1942, there were scores of birds scattered around the bombed out buildings. The ruins seem to remind them of the rocky country that's their natural home and to provide an abundance of insect food as a bonus. Now they're knocking Beckton gasworks down, it doesn't look so different from those first bomb sites where the Black Red Starts nested during the war. And when you think about it, it's not such a bad place for a bird to set up house and home. There are an enormous number of holes and cavities in which something like a Black Red Start or wrens that we've seen around here can build a nest. And it's undisturbed as well. Not many people come around here to, to put the birds to flight. With the land shortage being what it is, we can't afford to let Beckton become some kind of museum for wasteland rarities. But whilst it is still here, isn't it a delight that a bird as rare and beautiful as the Black Red Star should choose it for its home? City birds show splendid resourcefulness in making use of man-made habitats. These sand martins, which normally dig out their own two-foot-deep nesting tunnels, have been using this prefab accommodation in some reservoir drain pipes for over 40 years. And there are plants, too, which can take advantage of human structures. A crack in the concrete is all a dandelion needs to get one of its 200-odd seeds settled. And plantain's low-lying leaves are so resistant to trampling feet and car tyres that it's become one of the commonest weeds of roads and trackways all over the world. And if you should get lost at a cloverleaf junction, you might just be lucky and find a compass plant. This is prickly lettuce, now a fairly rampant weed in urban and waste places, which was probably introduced into this country in the 17th century for a sleeping potion from the laudanum in its leaves. But it also has the useful habit of turning its leaves up in the sunlight anyway and aligning them in the north-south plain. It's sad how blind we are to these other inhabitants of our cities. How often do we notice birds above our heads, or mosses underfoot, or for that matter, flowers right under our noses? And how often do we spare a moment from reading the paper on the train to work, to look at the flowers along the embankments? It needs a sharp eye and a steady stomach early in the morning, but it's well worth the effort. If you should decide to take botanical train spotting seriously, any qualms you may have about where you sit with respect to the engine will have to go out of the window. What you must try and grab is a, a seat on the north side of the compartment, looking out at the sunny south-facing banks, which are hopefully the ones that have the best flowers. The first botanical commuter was probably Oxford Ragwort, which arrived on the Great Western Railway after escaping from Oxford's Botanic Gardens in the 19th century. Its seeds are helped on their way by the train slipstream, and the plant has now spread over the whole railway network. But it's the grassy embankments that are the real treasure house. They're safe from human meddlers, sunny and well-drained. There's scarcely a better place to see our summer wildflowers in spectacular masses.
Budlia, much loved by the butterflies, began its term in this country as a garden plant from Asia. But it's as much at home on a stony concrete platform as on the rocky slopes of the Himalayas. They can be tantalising, though, those big clumps rushing past. I would love to have got to grips with what I think was a bamboo plantation just outside Gidea Park Station. And too many cricks of the neck in gazing out at things like this, and the communication call becomes a real temptation. But one flower you'll have no difficulty in recognising is the rose bay willow herb. Rose bay is now one of the most successful, as well as one of the showiest, of our urban flowers. Part of the reason for its spread along railway embankments is that it has a liking for ground that has been burnt, which happened often in the days of steam trains. As with the Black Red Start, it was the Blitz that gave Rose Bay its big chance. The burnt out areas were ablaze with this fireweed only months after the bombing, and from these huge colonies it spread out across our cities. It was Rose Bay's clever reproductive engineering that enabled it to take advantage of this habitat. Each one of the seeds in this, this mass that's formed when the, the pod splits open weighs less than one ten thousandth of a gram, and yet there are something like 80,000 of them on each plant. And each one, in fact, has a, a tiny little parachute of hairs attached to the seed itself, and these help waft the, the seed out on the, the winds in summer hopefully to come down on another piece of disturbed ground. The joke is that Rose Bay only needs all those seeds as an insurance policy. The spreading roots do almost all the work in building up a clump like this. People talk about insects inheriting the earth. I fancy it's going to be the weeds. Birds, too, are raising their next generation and singing out their territorial claims as they do. Hearing their songs above the traffic can be an even greater delight in a bleak city than it is in the countryside. But it poses special problems for recordists like Ken and Joyce Hayslock. As you do most of your recording in outer London, um, I imagine there are some rather special hazards that... Uh, the sound recorders have to watch out for. Could you tell us a bit about this? Well, I think the main um, hazard and the worst hazard is the motor car, um, mainly because the uh, spectrum of the sound of the motor car is so wide that you can't possibly filter it out. If you filter the deep notes out, you get the high notes. I suppose one way out of the problem is to, to get away from it all and come to areas like this which are, which are naturally screened. Uh, but if you can't do that, um, are there any other special measures you can take? The use of the parabolic reflector does uh, help quite considerably, but the only trouble with a parabolic reflector is that you still get um, deep notes from the back. The rifle mic um, is a little more discriminating, but it gives you a wider angle. I believe you're doing some rather special work on, on blackbirds. I'm running a project for the Wildlife Sound Recording Society on blackbirds, and um, the main thing is to try and investigate the life of the blackbird purely through its sound. Uh, again, the trouble is in London, of course, as your blackbird starts to produce this, you get some of this banging a car door. But many urban birds have more to worry about than the slam of a car door. Here, on this exposed and barren patch of waste ground near the docks, a pair of little ring plovers is nesting. Little ring plovers' natural nesting sites are shingly riverbanks. But ever since they first bred in Britain in 1938, they've preferred rough man-made replicas of these habitats, like gravel pits, cement works and disused airfields. Yet they seem to thrive in these surroundings, and every year well over 200 pairs raise their young against a background of excavators and industrial machinery.
It's a remarkable feat that this plucky bird should have successfully run the gauntlet of so many human pressures and been able to protect its chicks from predators in such an exposed site. Foxes are one of the predators that are becoming increasingly common in towns. Many of them migrated in from the country along the railway tracks and have adopted a thoroughly urban lifestyle, looting dustbins for their evening meals and living in allotment lean-tos and cemeteries. Some, like this family, have actually established an earth within feet of a railway track. But it's man, not the trains, that is still the biggest danger to the fox. Their scavenging activities aren't popular with tidy householders, nor is the mangy condition, very obvious in this family, that such a poor diet can put them in. And in many suburban areas, a rather vicious extermination campaign is in progress. It's a sad fate for an animal whose wildness, for me, more than makes up for its occasional lapses into delinquency. Badgers are more popular, but they need peace for their sets and space for their complex family life. And they've decamped to the outer suburbs, away from the traffic and new housing development. But though they're more particular about their diet than foxes, they can be persuaded to come and feed in suburban gardens. They bustle about under the porch light as if they'd never been suspicious nocturnal animals. Yet of all the predators which help brighten up a city skyline, pride of place must go to the kestrel. It's a squatter by nature, even in the countryside, and has happily moved into any makeshift urban cubbyhole it can find. It isn't a large bird. Its hunting stoops aren't as spectacular as those of its cousin, the peregrine. Yet what a thrill it is to see one arched out in a perfectly controlled stall against the wind as it hunts over the rooftops. The kestrel's diet, like the heron's, has been shaped by the market forces of the city's economy. With half-tamed sparrows on tap in every garden, what falcon is going to waste its energy chasing mice? Our sense of wildness is so dependent on setting. These ring-necked parakeets from Asia are the sort of birds you'd expect to see in a zoo, and you'd probably pass them by without a second look. but set them in a suburban park, and not just the birds, but the trees are transformed and given a real touch of the tropics. Parakeets are actually breeding in the wild here now. After making a run of successful breakouts, 
and finding our mild winters and well-stocked bird tables much to their liking. There's certainly a slice of wildlife in a city. Cage birds on the run, stowaway plants, scavengers and squatters. Along a canal, they're not such a surprise, for you learn to expect almost anything on these abandoned industrial waterways. Their original function means that they run right through the working heart of a city. Yet now they're scarcely used commercially, they provide a wealth of undisturbed habitats for wildlife. And for humans, for that matter. You see an unfamiliar face on a city, creeping behind it like this. It's the tradesman's entrance, a world of backyards and forgotten corners that the planners haven't got their hands on yet. We had no idea when we set out that we'd come across this abandoned gasworks with its archway lagoon and waterside weeds. But it's the surprise which is half the excitement, the discovery of a secret wasteland garden behind the factory wall. It's extraordinary what an abundance of plants manage to find their way into odd corners like this. But this one, Canadian fleabane, certainly has a tradition of travelling about. Its seeds reputedly immigrated into this country in the 17th century, inside the stuffing of a bird. And now it's one of the commonest weeds in the urban areas. In spite of the apparent filthiness of the water, there's as pretty a collection of old streamside herbs by this canal basin as you'd likely find by any river. There's burr marigold here, skull cap, which they used to give for headaches on account of the curious skull shape of its flowers. Along here, I think there's some great willow herb, uh, also known as codlins and cream, reed grass, and gypsy wort in, in great quantities here. This is a, a, a most curious plant that yields a, a very dark dye, and before the days of the Race Relations Act, it was apparently used for blacking people up.
Refuse is another of the city's hidden faces. It's a shock when you see the volume of it, the sheer waste of materials. But not all of it is literally wasted. Mixed up with the tin cans and the polythene bags are all the botanical odds and ends we use in our everyday lives, waiting for their moment to bloom again. In spite of the amazing mixed grill of rubbish that's being dumped around us at the moment, it's sometimes difficult to believe how particular plants could ever have found their way here. This rather sinister, but I think very beautiful plant is thorn apple, um, a member of the nightshade family, which was introduced as a medicinal herb to this country from Peru in the 17th century. Quite a lot of the modern specimens you find sprouting up here and there come into this country in, in bags of South American fertilizers. But I wonder if this particular specimen, that let's face it is growing miles away from the nearest agricultural field, could really have come here that way. There's one other explanation. Thorn apple seeds can remain dormant under the ground for up to a hundred years. And since we know that thorn apple was being grown in little herb gardens and physic gardens all over London during the 18th and 19th century, I wonder if it is possible that one of those seeds, in fact quite a lot of these seeds, um, could have been turned up by the bulldozers and given rise to these splendid plants. And it was a potent drug, even by the rather hair-raising standards of those days. Let me read you a, an extract from a 17th century herbal. And wenches give half a dram of it to their lovers in beer or wine. And some are so well skilled in dosing of it that they can make men mad for as many hours as they please. Well, we might find that a bit hard to take these days, but it's a piece of growing history anyway. And there's growing geography too, when you think where we get our plant resources from. No idea what we might find today, but since this lot's going to be covered up by rubbish in the next few weeks, for once we're going to be allowed to do a bit of picking. Well, we've got a real little treasure trove here of the sorts of plants that spring up from thrown away budgie seed, very oily seeds that are very good food for birds. We've got uh, an extraordinary little, I think it comes from Africa, um, knapweed here. It's the most beautiful um, lilac pink colour. Um, we've got some flaxes. One of the best blues you could have in an English field when they grow it here. Canary grasses. And all manner of, of oily seed bearing grasses here that, that are used at some stage or another in bird seed mixtures. This was a real find, a safflower from the Middle East, one of the plants the ancient Egyptians used to make rouge. The one plant I'm not allowed to pick. But I bet the local birds have a time of it, feeding off hemp seed through the winter. The cannabis wasn't the only reminder of the American deserts. Growing amongst this smouldering foundry waste, we found a colony of tumbleweed. It was there courtesy of Henry Ford rather than John, but there was a kind of ghost town in the distance, so... I suppose you might die of suffocation on one of these tips, but not, I think, of starvation. There's as much human food thrown onto these tips as there is bird food. Um, some cabbages here. Runner beans over here. Not yet in the pod. But there are some broad beans which are here. A bit old, but uh, you might get some get some to store out of them. Lettuce, actually a quite nice one. Worth taking home, I think that one. Tomatoes, of course, all over the place. A bit green, but they are in the gardens this year. And then some mint, just to flavour the whole thing off at the end.
And if you want to finish off your table decorations, you could fix and mill it, but um, beware of the cheap plastic imitation. Or perhaps, to be really fancy, a good pure fruit bowl. In nature, waste is the lifeblood of new growth. This is a sewage farm, one of the last in the country still operating sludge settling beds. And it's situated in a unique position at the end of a runway at London Airport. The beds, which are very rich in worms and insects, are immensely popular with birds, especially waders, who no doubt find the surface texture familiar too. These Dunlin have stopped off to refuel on their long autumn migration flight south. The starlings, on the other hand, are probably local birds, chancing their feet for the sake of the pickings. Unlike garden birds, waders are built to cope with mud. This ring plover is springing over the spongy sludge as if it were on a trampoline. And you can see in these rough how perfectly waders are adapted to life in muddy habitats. The long bill and neck the dancer's legs set well back for balance. The little stint is one of the scarcer visitors to these farms. Although it's no bigger than a robin, its migration flights can take it 6,000 miles between Lapland and Africa. And the turnstone, an obsessive prober and forager, which really is turning stones here, will sometimes winter as far away as Australia. The sheer scale of these unassisted migration flights, spanning whole oceans and continents, makes a mockery of the inefficiency of the jets. And to add to the insult, the birds remain quite indifferent to the fumes and hubbub around them. You could scarcely find a bigger contrast with a sewage farm than this lush suburban churchyard, but this too is a refuse tip of a kind, and it's partly what lies under the earth that's responsible for the respect we show these places. Because they're disturbed so little, churchyards can often build up quite settled communities of plants and animals. Missile thrushes feed in the old yew trees, and the grass, if it's not mown too ferociously, can often be rich with meadow flowers. They stand a better chance of living on undisturbed here than they ever would amongst the weed killer sprays on a modern farm. but it's probably the stonework in old churches that's their greatest value to wildlife. In many urban areas, it's the only really old stone to be found, a kind of inland rockscape, if you like. And plants that like stony places, like these ferns, can very often settle in, in, in the cracks between them. And look how this yew has sprung up, probably from a stone dropped by those hungry missile thrushes we saw earlier. There were four species on this one face, including this splendid heart's tongue. And you can sometimes find genuine antique lichens on the tombstones that were put up before the air got too filthy. 
1770, that one. And in the Belfry, as well as starlings and swifts, yes, bats. John Hooper has made a special study of city bats and has developed a sonar detector to help identify them from their call notes. September the 12th, time 7.20, tuning setting 22 kilohertz. One knock you are flying overhead now. He's still fairly high up. Um, I hope you'll come a bit closer soon so I can get a better recording. Hello, John. Hello, Richard. I see we've actually managed to see a nocturne tonight. Yes, we were lucky indeed tonight, in spite of the weather. What amazes me, I think, about bats in London is where on earth they find to roost. Well, I think this puzzles me also. I mean, the nocturne, if you've seen tonight, that could well come from a hollow tree because they very often get into trees. But where the pipish trails, which we also get around this lake, come from, I just don't know. Perhaps some of them put down in churches, do you think? Yes, could be. In these sort of outer bits of London, one gets them in buildings, even in bungalows and places like that. But what they do in central London... Getting into the lofts and things. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. what, what, what sort of species do you get in London generally? Well, we certainly get the noctule and pipistrelle. They're very common. Um, on Hampstead Heath, I've had Dorbenton's bats, and there probably are bats like long-eared. Um, they've certainly been recorded in London, but um, there's no good trying to pick them up with this ultrasonic gadgetry because the, the long-eared only um, can be heard about six feet away from the microphone. <laughs> when it's close to that, you can see it yes. anyhow. As the winter starts to clamp down on northern Europe, huge numbers of wildfowl start flying south in search of open water. And they find it, as often as not, in the centre of cities, in those man-made lakes and reservoirs that, because of the warmth of the buildings and the general heat of cities, stay unfrozen for much longer. We're only two miles from King's Cross at the moment, in a rather bleak and unlikely-looking situation, surrounded by tower blocks. But in the heart of winter, this, this reservoir here is packed with feeding wildfowl and other water birds. Tufted ducks from Iceland and pochard from Siberia are the commonest. And during a cold snap, they can build up flocks several thousand strong. But the star attraction at these reservoirs must be the smew, a scarce visitor from the Arctic, which wildfowlers used to call the white nun. Whilst we were filming these birds, we were lucky enough to witness something rarely seen in this country. It was an exceptionally mild winter day, and a pair of smew, turned on by the warmth and sunshine, I imagine, slid into their full courtship and mating ritual. It was a beautiful and convincing ceremony. But these birds would be a thousand miles away before they settled to breed in earnest. All birds live at what for us would be fever heat, burning up as much as a third of their body weight every winter's day. No wonder that starlings come in thousands to roost in the warm city centres. They're a reminder, at this heart of the winter solstice, of just what a perilous business survival is for a wild creature. Many of the birds huddle together on the buildings themselves, which can't seem so different to their ancestral cliff-face homes, and are certainly a good deal warmer. 
and it looks as though these roosts also serve as a kind of information centre in which the birds pull the knowledge they've gained during the day about new feeding places. Yet a bird needs privacy as well as a sociable community life and throughout the early part of the night the starlings will be establishing their personal territories on the ledges. But the prize for adaptability must surely go to these birds, relaxing in the most unusual centrally heated wildlife residence in the city. During the day, starlings fly out to feed in the suburbs. These ones to the same provident tip we visited in the autumn. They scavenge on scraps of thrown away food and on the insects which throng in the rubbish. It's probably the great quantities of waste food in cities that has helped gulls to become thoroughly urban birds. An opportunist at that was ready to snatch a sandwich as a lugworm. But in the end, human titbits alone won't be enough to save wildlife in the built-up areas. We must clean up our environment as well, particularly the air and rivers. This has already happened with the Thames, to such an extent, in fact, that these lower reaches along here have been scheduled as a major international wildfire habitat. If there's a cold spell, there can be as many as 10,000 ducks gathered here. There aren't such big numbers this mild winter, but still enough mallard, teal and especially shell duck to put on a dramatic show when they fly up. It's the muddy foreshore exposed when the tide goes out that attracts the feeding duck. The shell duck and mallard, which we've already seen, and these pintail, are all principally ground feeders. Almost all these duck here live off the same food. It's a tiny mudworm called tubifex. It's been here rather longer than the, the clean water, as it's a little worm with a, a fascinating adaptation to living in extremely polluted and muddy conditions. They're a devil to find, but let's have a look. This is the kind of place they ought to be. Worms of this group contain haemoglobin, which you can see here as a red thread. In these worms, it serves the same function as it does in our bodies, storing oxygen, which can be in short supply in mud or polluted water. There's been an improvement, too, in the number and variety of fish in the river. A rod and line wouldn't be much use in checking this, but if you don't object to a spot of technological trawling, there is a way that's perhaps more appropriate in these surroundings. Millions of gallons of river water are pumped through this power station every day to cool the generators, and are first passed through a filter to remove any solid objects, fish included. Wynne Wheeler, from the British Museum of Natural History, uses this convenient fish trap to monitor the species which are now in the Thames. Over 60 different species have been recorded so far, and the number grows every year. Well, we, we've got a, a very varied bag here, and rather more species than you find on a fish fungus slab, I think. These large ones here are flounders. They're flat fishes, as you can see, but yeah. quite like fresh water, and come up the river up as far as Richmond nowadays. 
They didn't used to. Um, here we have got a sole. Very, very young ones, aren't they, then? Yes, they are. They're, they're very young. They're called slips by the local fishermen. And are these the, the, the lemon or Dover sole? Oh, no, this is this is the Dover sole. This is the common sole in British waters and on the fisher on this slab, of course. Yes. Now, these long things are obviously eels. This is a freshwater eel we've got here. And the silver ones, of course, are very familiar. These are sprats. You see them on almost any fishmonger slab. And what's this? Is this a prawn or a shrimp? Or? Oh, that's a brown shrimp. They, of course, are very common in the river. They used to be fished for commercially. This is a, a nice specimen here. What was that? Oh, that's a smelt. He's really rather lovely. A member of the salmon family, you can see by the fin on the back here. And he's got some very large teeth. You look. Is that an indication of really clean water with a, with a salmon family coming up? Yes, the smelt is very much a fussy fish. Yeah. And he comes right up the river these days, up as far as Wandsworth. And these, of course, are shore crabs. You get plenty of those very familiar to the seaside holiday maker. Yes. And very common now in the river at this area. I asked Wynne whether or not these fish were clean, coming as they did from a still slightly suspect river. He pointed out the very healthy state of their gills and added that they were in such good condition that he quite often ate them. And they make a meal for the common terns in their spring migration flights up the river. I think it's very cheering that Londoners, too, may soon be able to eat Thames Court eels and shrimps again. For urban wildlife isn't just a spectacle, a kind of circus act inside the big top of the city. It's also a parable of how, even in the densest built-up areas, our lives are penetrated by the flow of the seasons and by the toings and froings of other creatures. Perhaps one day we'll be able to enjoy their lives as much as they, with enormous tolerance and adaptability, have shown their willingness to share in ours. Thank you.